Hi everybody and welcome to lesson three of Practical Deep Learning for Coders. Um, we did a um, quick survey this week to see how um, people feel that uh, the course is tracking and um, um, over half of you think it's about right pace and of the rest who aren't, some of you think it's a bit slow and some of you think it's a bit, sorry, some of you think it's a bit slow and some of you think it's a bit fast. So hopefully we're, <laughs> that's about the best we can do. Um, generally speaking, the first two lessons are a little more easy pacing for anybody who's already familiar with the kind of basic technology pieces. And then the later lessons get, you know, more into kind of some of the foundations. And today we're going to be talking about, um, you know, things like the matrix multiplications and gradients and calculus and stuff like that. Um, so for those of you who are more mathy and less computery, you might find this one more comfortable and vice versa. Um, so um, remember that there is a uh, official course updates thread where you can see um, all of the up-to-date info uh, about everything you need to know and of course the course website um, as well. So by the time you know uh, you watch the video of the lesson, it's pretty likely that if you come across a question or an issue, somebody else will have. Um, so definitely search the forum and check the facts um, first, and then of course feel free to ask a question yourself on the forum if you can't find your answer. Um, one thing I did want to point out, which you'll see in the lesson thread and the course website, is there is also a lesson zero. Um, lesson zero is um, based heavily on um, Radek's book, Meta Learning, which internally is based heavily on all the things that I've said over the years about how to learn fast AI. Um, it's, uh, we try to make the course full of tidbits about the science of learning itself and put them into the course. It's a different course to probably any other you've taken, and it's, I strongly recommend watching Lesson Zero as well. The last bit of Lesson Zero is about how to set up a Linux box from scratch, which you can happily skip over unless that's of interest, but the rest of it is um, full of juicy information that I think you'll find useful. Um, so the basic idea of, of what to do to do a fast.ai lesson is watch the lecture. Um, and I generally, you know, on the video, recommend watching it all the way through without stopping once and then go back and watch it with lots of pauses, running the notebook as you go. Because otherwise you're kind of like running the notebook without really knowing where it's heading, if that makes sense. Um, and the idea of running the notebook is, is you could, you know, there's a few notebooks you could go through. So obviously there's the book. So going through chapter one of the book, going through chapter two of the book as notebooks, running every code cell and experimenting with inputs and outputs to try and understand what's going on. Um, and then trying to reproduce those results um, and then trying to repeat the whole thing with a different data set. And if you can do that last step, you know, that's um, a, quite a stretch goal, particularly at the start of the course because there's so many new concepts, but that really shows that you, you've got it sorted. Now for this third bit, reproduce results, um, I recommend using, uh, you'll find in the fast book repo, so the repository for the book, there is a special folder called plain. And plain contains all of the same chapters of the book but with all of the text removed, except for headings, and all of the outputs removed. And this is a great way for you to test your understanding of the chapter, is before you run each cell, try to say to yourself, okay, what's this for? And what's it gonna output, if anything? And if you kind of work through that slowly, that's a great way, and any time you're not sure, you can jump back to the, the version of the notebook with the text to remind yourself and then head back over to the clean version. Um, so there's an idea for something which a lot of people find really uh, useful for self-study. I say self-study, but of course, um, as we've mentioned before, um, the best kind of study is study done to some extent with others. Um, for most people, um, you know, the research shows that, that you're more likely to stick with things if you're doing it as kind of a bit of a social activity. The, uh, the forums are a great place to find and create um, study groups. 
Um, and you'll also find on the forums a link to um, our Discord server. Um, so our yes, our Discord server, um, where there are some study groups there as well. Um, so uh, you know, in-person study groups, virtual study groups are a great way to um, you know really make good progress and find other people at a similar level to you. Um, if there's not a study group going at your level in your area in your time zone, um, create one. So you just post something saying, hey, let's create a study group. So this week there's been a lot of fantastic activity. Um, I can't show all of it, so what I did was I used the um, summary functionality in the forums to grab all of the things with the highest votes, and so I'll just quickly show a few of those. We have a Marvel detector created um, this week. Um, identify your favorite Marvel character. Um, I love this, a rock, paper, scissors game where you actually use pictures of the rock, paper, scissors symbols, and apparently the, the computer always loses. That's my favorite kind of game. Um, there is a lot of Elon around, so very handy to have an Elon detector to you know, either find more of him if that's what you need, or maybe less of him. Um, I thought this one was very interesting. Um, I love these kind of really interesting ideas of like, gee, I wonder if this would work. Can you predict the average um, temperature uh, of an area based on a aerial photograph? And, the, and apparently the answer is, yeah, actually you can predict it pretty well. Here in Brisbane, it was predicted, I believe, to within one and a half Celsius. Um, I think this student is actually a genuine meteorologist, if I remember correctly. He built a cloud detector. Um, so then building on top of the um, what's your favorite Marvel character, there's now a, also an Isidore Marvel character. Um, my daughter loves this one. What dinosaur is this? And I'm not as good about dinosaurs as I should be. I feel like there's 10 times more dinosaurs than there was when I was a kid, so I, I never know their names, so this is very handy. This is cool. Uh, choose your own adventure, where you choose your path using facial expressions. And uh, I think this music genre classification uh, is also really cool. Um, Brian Smith uh, created a Microsoft Power App um, application that actually runs on a mobile phone, um, so that's pretty cool. Wouldn't be surprised to hear that Brian actually works at Microsoft, so also an opportunity to promote <laughs> his, uh, his own stuff there. Um, I thought this art movement classifier was interesting in that like, there's a really interesting discussion on the forum about what it actually shows about similarities between different art movements. Um, and I thought this uh, redaction uh, detector project was really, was really cool um, as well. And there's a whole tweet thread and blog post and everything about this one, uh, particularly great piece of work. Okay, so um, I'm going to uh, quickly show you uh, a couple of little tips before we kind of jump into the mechanics of what's behind a neural network, um, which is I was playing a little bit with how do you make your neural network more accurate during the week, and so I created this um, pet detector, and uh, this pet detector is not just predicting, uh, predicting dogs or cats, but what breed is it? That's obviously a much more difficult exercise. Now, um, because I put this out on Hugging Face Spaces, um, you can uh, download and look at my code because if you just click Files and Versions on the space, which you can find a link on the forum and the course website, you, you can see them all here and you can download it to your own computer. Um, so I'll show you what I've got here. Now, um, one thing I'll mention is today I'm using a different platform. Um, so in the past I've shown you Colab and I've shown you Kaggle, um, and we've also looked at doing stuff on your own computer, not so much training models on your computer, but using the models you've trained to create applications. Um, Paperspace is a, another website a bit like Kaggle and Google. Um, but in particular, they have a product called Gradient Notebooks, which is, at least as I speak, and things change all the time, so check the course website, but as I speak, in my opinion, is, is by far the best platform for um, running this course and for you know doing experimentation. Um, I'll explain why as we go. So why haven't I been using the past two weeks? Um, because I've been waiting for them to build some stuff 
uh, for us <laughs> to make it particularly good, and they just they just finished. So I've been using it all week, and it's totally amazing. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, so you've got a machine running in the cloud, but the thing that uh, was very special about it is it's a it's a real it's a real computer you're using. It's not like that kind of weird virtual version of things that Kaggle or Colab has. So if you whack on this button down here, you'll get a full version of JupyterLab, um, or you can switch over to a full version of classic Jupyter Notebooks. And I'm actually going to do uh, stuff in JupyterLab today because it's a pretty good environment for beginners who are not familiar with the terminal, which I know a lot of people in the course are in that situation. You can do really everything um, kind of graphically. There's a file browser, so here you can see I've got my pets repo. Um, it's got a git repository thing. You can pull and push to git. Um, and then you can also uh, open up a terminal, create new notebooks, um, and so forth. So what I tend to do with this is I tend to go into a full screen because it's kind of like its own whole IDE. Um, and so you can see I've got here my, my terminal, and here's my notebook. Um, they have free GPUs. Um, and most importantly, there's two good features. One is that you can pay, I think it's eight or nine dollars a month to get better GPUs, and basically as many as you, you know, as many hours as you want. Um, and they have persistent storage. So with Colab, if you've played with it, you might have noticed it's annoying. You have to muck around with saving things to Google Drive and stuff. On Kaggle, there isn't really a way of um, kind of having a persistent environment. Um, where else on paper space you have, you know, whatever you save in your storage, it's going to be there the next time you come come back. So um, I'm going to be adding walkthroughs of all of this functionality. Um, so look at so if you're interested in really taking advantage of this, um, check those out. Um, okay, so I think the main thing that I wanted you to take away from lesson two isn't necessarily all the details of how do you use a particular platform to train models and deploy them into applications through, through JavaScript or online platforms. But the key thing I wanted you to understand was the concept. There's really two pieces. There's the training piece, and at the end of the training piece you end up with this model.pickle file. right? And once you've got that, that's now a thing where you feed it inputs and it spits out outputs um, based on that model that you trained. And then, so you don't need, you know, because that happens pretty fast, you generally don't need a GPU once you've got that trained. And so then there's a separate step, which is deploying. So I'll show you how I trained my um, pet classifier. Um, so you can see I've got two IPython notebooks. One is app, which is the one that's going to be doing the inference and production. One is the one where I train the model. Um, so this first bit I'm going to skip over because you've seen it before. I, I create my image data loaders, check that my data looks okay with show batch, train a ResNet 34, and I get 7% um, accuracy. So that's pretty good. Um, But check this out. There's a link here to a notebook um, I created. Actually, most of the work was done by Ross Whiteman, um, where we can try to improve this by finding a better architecture. Um, there are, I think, at the moment in the PyTorch image models library, over 500 architectures, and we'll be learning over the course, you know, what what they are, how they differ. But you know, broadly speaking. They're all mathematical functions, you know, which are basically matrix multiplications and um, and these these nonlinearities, such as um, uh, ReLUs that we we'll talk about today. Um, so most of the time, those details don't matter. What we care about is three things: how fast are they, how much memory do they use, and how accurate are they. And so, what I've done here with Ross is we've grabbed all of the models from PyTorch image uh, image models. And you can see all the code we've got, there's very, very little code, 
um, to create this, this plot. Um, now, uh, my screen resolution is a bit. There we go, let's do that. And so on this plot, on the x axis, we've got um, seconds per sample, so how fast is it? So to the left is better, is faster. And on the right is how accurate is it? So how, how accurate was it on ImageNet in particular? And so generally speaking, you want things that are up towards the top and left. Now we've been mainly working with ResNet, and you can see down here, here's ResNet 18. Now ResNet 18 is, is a particularly small and fast version for prototyping. We often use ResNet 34, which is this one here. And you can see this kind of like classic model that's very widely used actually nowadays isn't the state of the art anymore. Um, so we can start to look up at these ones up here and find out some of these better models. The ones that seem to be the most accurate and fast are these Levitt models. Um, so I tried them out on my pets and I found that they didn't work particularly well. So I thought, okay, let's try something else out. So next up I tried these Convnext models. And this one in here was particularly interesting. It's kind of like super high accuracy. It's the, you know, if you want 0.001 seconds inference time, it's the most accurate. So I tried that. So how do we try that? All we do is I can say, so the um, PyTorch image models uh, is in the TIM module. So at the very start I imported that. And we can say list models and pass in a, a glob, a match. And so this is going to show all the convnext models. And here I can find the ones that I just saw. And all I need to do is when I create the vision learner, I just put the name of the model in as a string. Okay, so you were saying earlier this one is not a string. That's because it's a model that FastAI provides, the library. Um, FastAI only provides a pretty small number. Um, so if you install Tim, so you need to pip install Tim or Condor install Tim, you'll get hundreds more and you put that in a string. So if I now train that, the time for these epochs goes from 20 seconds to 27 seconds. So it is a little bit slower. Um, but the accuracy goes from 7.2% down to 5.5%. So, you know, that's a pretty big relative difference. Um, 7.2 divided by 5.5. .5. Yeah, so about a 30% improvement. Um, so that's pretty fantastic. And, you know, it's, um, it's been a few years, honestly, um, since we've seen anything really beat ResNet that's, that's widely available and usable on regular GPUs. Um, so this is, this is a big step. And so this is a, you know, there's a few architectures nowadays that really are probably better choices a lot of the time. And these conf, so if you are not sure what to use, try these conf next architectures. You might wonder what the names are about. Well, obviously, tiny, small, large, etc. is how big is the model. So that'll be how much memory is it going to take up and how fast is it. Um, and then these ones here that say N22FT1K, these ones have been trained on more data. So ImageNet, there's two different ImageNet data, data sets. There's one that's got a thousand categories of pictures, and there's another one that's got 22,000 categories of pictures. So this is trained on the one with 22,000 categories of pictures. Um, so these are generally going to be more accurate on kind of standard photos of natural objects. Okay, so from there I exported my model, and that's the end. Okay, so now I've trained my model, and I'm all done. Um, you know, other things you could do, obviously, is add more epochs, for example, um, you could add image augmentation, there's various things you can do. But, you know, I found this, this is actually pretty, pretty hard to beat this by much. Um, if any of you find you can do better, I'd love to hear about it. So then, uh, to turn that into an application, I just did the same thing that we saw last week, which was to uh, load the learner. Um, now this is something I did want to show you. It, the, the learner, once we load it and call predict, spits out a list of 37 numbers. That's because there are 37 breeds of dog and cat. So these are the probability of each of those breeds. What order they, are they in? 
Um, that's an important question. Um, the answer is that fast AI always stores this information about categories, this is a category in this case of dog or cat breed, in something called the vocab object, and it's inside the data loaders. So we can grab those categories, and that's just a list of strings, just tells us the order. So if we now zip together the categories and the probabilities, we'll get back a dictionary that tells you, um, well, like so. So here's that list of categories, and here's the probability of each one. And this was a Basset Hound, so there you can see, yep, almost certainly a Basset Hound. So from there, just like last week, we can go and create our interface, and then, uh, and then launch it. Um, and there we go. Okay, so what did we just do, really? What is this um, magic model.pickle file? So we can take a look at the model.pickle file. Um, it's an object type called a learner, and a learner has uh, two main things in it. The first is the list of pre-processing steps that you did to turn your images into things of the model. And that's basically um, this information here. So it's your data blocks or your image data loaders or whatever. And then the second thing, most importantly, is the trained model. And so you can actually grab the trained model by just grabbing the dot model attribute. So I'm just going to call that M. And then if I type M, I can look at the model. And so here it is. Lots of stuff. So what is this stuff? Well, we'll, we'll learn about it all over time. But basically what you'll find is it contains lots of layers, because this is a deep learning model. And you can see it's kind of like a tree. That's because lots of the layers themselves consist of layers. So there's a whole layer called the Tim body, which is most of it. And then right at the end there's a second layer called sequential. And then the Tim body contains something called model, and it can, then it contains something called stem, and something called stages, and then stages contain 0, 1, 2, etc. So what is all this stuff? Well, let's take a look at one of them. So to take a look at one of them, there's a really convenient um, method in PyTorch called getSubmodule, where we can pass in a kind of a dotted string navigating through this hierarchy. So zero model stem one goes zero model stem one. So this is going to return this layer norm 2D thing. So what is this layer norm 2D thing? Well, the key thing is um, it's got some code, it's with the mathematical function that we talked about. And then the other thing that we learned about is it has parameters. And so we can list its parameters and look at this. It's just lots and lots and lots of numbers. Let's grab another example. We could have a look at 0.model.stages.0.blocks.1.mlp.fc1 and parameters. Another big bunch of numbers. So what's going on here? What are these numbers? And where on earth did they come from? And how come these numbers can figure out whether something is a Basset Hound or not? Okay, so to answer that question, we're going to have a look at a um, Kaggle notebook. How does a neural network really work? Um, I've got a local version of it here, which I'm going to take you through. And the basic idea is um, machine learning models are things that fit functions to data. So we start out with a very, very flexible, in fact an infinitely flexible, as we've discussed, function, a neural network. And we get it to do a particular thing, which is to recognize the patterns in the data examples we give it. So let's do a much simpler example than a neural network. Let's do a quadratic. So let's create a function f, which is 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Okay, so it's a quadratic with coefficients 3, 2, and 1. So we can plot that function f and give it a title. If you haven't seen this before, things between dollar signs is what's called LaTeX. It's basically how we can create kind of typeset mathematical equations. Okay, so let's run that. 
And so here you can see the function, here you can see the title I passed it, and here is our quadratic. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to imagine that we don't know that's the true mathematical function we're trying to find. Okay, so it's obviously much simpler than the function that figures out whether a, an image is a Basset hound or not, but we're just going to start super simple. So th this is the real function, and we're going to try to, to, to recreate it from some data. Um, now it's going to be very helpful if we have an easier way of creating different quadratics. Um, so I have to find a kind of a general form of a quadratic here, with, the, with coefficients a, b, and c, and at some particular point x, it's going to be ax squared plus bx plus c. And so let's test that. Okay, so that's uh, for x equals 1.5, that's 3x squared plus 2x plus 1, which is the quadratic we were, did before. Now we're going to want to create lots of different quadratics to test them out and find which one's best. Um, so this is a somewhat advanced but very, very helpful feature of Python that's worth learning if you're not familiar with it, and it's used in a lot of programming languages. It's called a partial application of a function. Basically I want this exact function, but I want to fix the values of a, b, and c to pick a particular quadratic. And the way you fix the values of the function is you call this thing in Python called partial, and you pass in the function, and then you pass in the values that you want to fix. So for example, if I now say make quadratic 3, 2, 1, that's going to create a quadratic equation with coefficients 3, 2, and 1. And you can see if I then pass in, so that's now f, if I pass in 1.5, I get the exact same value I did before. Okay, so we've now got an ability to create any quadratic uh, equation we want by passing in the uh, parameters of the, the coefficients of the quadratic, and that gives us a function that we can then just call as just like any normal function. So that only needs one thing now, which is the value of x, because the other three, a, b, and c, are now fixed. So if we plot that function, we'll get exactly the same shape, because it's the same uh, coefficients. Okay. So now I'm going to show an example of, of some data, uh, some data that, that matches the shape of this function. But in real life, um, data is never exactly going to match the shape of a function. Um, it's going to have some noise. So here's a couple of um, functions to add some noise. Um, uh, so you can see I've still got the basic functional form here, but this data is a bit dotted around it. Um, uh, the level to which you look at how I implemented these is entirely up to you. It's not like super necessary, um, but it's all stuff which, you know, the kind of things we use quite a lot. So this is to create normally distributed random numbers. Um, this is how we set the seed so that each time I run this I'm going to get the same random numbers. Um, this one is actually particularly helpful. This creates a, a a tensor, so a, a, in this case a vector, that goes from negative 2 to 2 in equal steps, and there's 20 of them. So that's why there's 20 steps along here. Uh, so then um, my y values is just f of x, um, with this amount of noise added. Okay, so um, as I say, the details of that don't matter too much. The main thing to know is we've got some random data now. And so this is the, the idea is now we're going to try to reconstruct the original quadratic equation, find one which matches this data. So how would we do that? Well, what we can do is we can create a, a function called plot quadratic that first of all plots our data as a scatter plot, and then it plots a function which is a quadratic the quadratic we pass in. Now there's a very helpful thing for experimenting in uh, Jupyter Notebooks, which is the at interact function. If you add it on top of a function, then it gives you these nice little sliders. So here's an example of a quadratic with coefficients 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. And okay, it doesn't fit particularly well. So how would we try to make this fit better? Well, I think what I'd do is I'd take the first slider, 
and I would try moving it to the left and see if it looks better or worse. Uh, that looks worse to me. I think it needs to be more curvy. So let's try the other way. Yeah, that doesn't look bad. Let's do the same thing for the next slider. Cover it this way. No, I think that's worse. Let's try the other way. Okay, final slider. Try this way. No, it's worse this way. So you can see what we can do. We can basically pick each of the coefficients one at a time, try increasing a little bit, see if that improves it, try decreasing it a little bit, see if that improves it, find the direction that improves it, and then slide it in that direction a little bit. And then when we're done, we can go back to the first one and see if we can make it any better. Now we've done that. Um, and actually, you can see that's not bad, because I know the uh, answer is meant to be 3, 2, 1, so they're pretty close. Um, and I, I wasn't cheating, I promise. Um, that's basically what we're going to do. That's basically how those parameters are created. But we obviously don't have time because um, the you know big fancy models have often hundreds of millions of parameters. We don't have time to try a hundred hundred million sliders. So we need something better. Um, well, the first step is we need a better idea of like when I move it, is it getting better or is it getting worse? So if you remember back to um, Arthur Samuel's description of machine learning that we learn about in chapter one of the book and in lesson one. We need some uh, something we can measure, which is a number that tells us how good is our model. And if we had that, then as we move these sliders, we could check to see whether it's getting better or worse. Um, so this is called a loss function. So there's lots of different loss functions you can pick, but perhaps the most uh, simple and common is mean squared error, which is going to be, so it's going to get in our predictions, and it's got the actuals, and we're going to go predictions minus actuals squared, and take the mean. So that's mean squared error. So if I now rerun the exact same thing I had before, but this time I'm going to calculate the loss, the MSC, between the values that we predict, f of x, remember where f is the quadratic we created, and the actuals, y. And this time I'm going to add a title to our function, which is the loss. So now, let's do this more rigorously. We're starting at a mean squared error of 11.46, so let's try moving this to the left and see if it gets better. No, worse, so move it to the right. Alright, somewhere around there. Okay, now let's try this one. Okay, best when I go to the right. Okay, what about C? 3.91. It's getting worse. So I keep going. Somewhere about there. And so now we can repeat that process, right? So we've, we've had each of A, B, and C move a little bit. Let's go back to A. Can I get any better than 3.28? Let's try moving left. Yeah, left was a bit better. And for B, let's try moving left. Worse. Right was better. And have it finally C, move to the right. Oh, definitely better. There we go. Okay, so that's a more rigorous approach. It's still manual, but at least we can like we don't have to rely on us to kind of recognize does it look better or look worse. So finally, we're going to automate this. So the key thing we need to know is for each parameter, when we move it up, does the loss get better, or when we move it down, does the loss get better? One approach would be to try it, right? We could manually increase the parameter a bit and see if the loss improves, and vice versa. But there's a much faster way, and the much faster way is to calculate its derivative. So if you've forgotten what a derivative is, no problem, there's lots of tutorials out there, you could go to Khan Academy or something like that, but in short, the derivative is what I just said. The derivative is a function that tells you if you increase the input, does the output increase or decrease, and by how much. So that's called the slope or the gradient. Now the good news is, PyTorch can automatically calculate that for you. So if you 
went through horrifying months of learning derivative rules in year 11 and are worried you're going to have to remember them all again, don't worry, you don't. Um, you don't have to calculate any of this yourself, it's all done for you, watch this. So the first thing to do is we need a function that takes the coefficients of the quadratic, a, b and c, as inputs. I'm going to put them all on a list, you'll see why in a moment, I'm going to call them parameters. We create a quadratic passing in those parameters a, b and c. Um, this star on the front is a very, very common thing in Python. Um, basically it takes these parameters and spreads them out to, to, to turn them into a, b and c and pass each of them to the function. So we've now got a, a quadratic with those coefficients, and then we return the mean squared error of our predictions against our actions. So this is a function that's going to take uh, the coefficients of a quadratic and return the loss. So let's try it. Okay, so if we start with a, b, and c of 1.5, we get a mean squared error of 11.46. Um, it looks a bit weird, it says it's a tensor, um, so don't worry about that too much. In short, in PyTorch, everything is a tensor. A tensor just means that you don't, it doesn't just work with numbers, it also works with lists or vectors of numbers, it's called a 1D tensor. Uh, rectangles of numbers, so tables of numbers, it's called a 2D tensor. Layers of tables of numbers, that's called a 3D tensor, and so forth. So in this case this is a single number, but it's still a tensor. That means it's just wrapped up in the PyTorch machinery that allows it to do things like calculate derivatives. But it's still just the number 11.46. Alright, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my parameters a, b, and c, and I'm going to put them all in a single 1D tensor. A 1D tensor is also known as a rank 1 tensor. So this is a rank 1 tensor. And it contains the list of numbers 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. And then I'm going to tell PyTorch that I want you to calculate the gradient for these numbers whenever we use them in a calculation. And the way we do that is we just say requires grad. So here is our tensor, it contains 1.5 three times, and it also tells us it's, we flagged it to say please calculate gradients for this particular tensor when we use it in calculations. So let's now use it in the calculation. We're going to pass it to that quad MSC. That's the function we just created that gets the MSC, the mean squared error, for a set of coefficients. And not surprisingly, it's the same number we saw before, 11.46. Okay. Not very exciting, but there is one thing that's very exciting, which is it's added an extra thing to the end called grad function. And this is the thing that tells us that if we wanted to, PyTorch knows how to create, calculate the gradients for our inputs. And to tell PyTorch, yes please, go ahead and do that calculation, you call backward on the result of your loss function. Now when I run it, nothing happens, or it doesn't look like nothing happens, but what does happen is it's just added an attribute called grad which is the gradient, to our inputs, A, B, C. So if we run this cell, this tells me that if I increase A, the loss will go down. If I increase B, the loss will go down a bit less. And if I increase C, the loss will go down. Now we want the loss to go down, right? So that means we should increase A, B, and C. Well, how much by? Well, given that A is says if you increase A even a little bit, the loss imp improves a lot. That suggests we're a long way away from the right answer, so we should probably increase this one a lot, this one the second most, and this one the third most. All right? So this is saying when I increase this parameter, the loss decreases. So in other words, we want to adjust our parameters A, B, and C by the negative of these. We want to increase, increase, increase. So we can do that by saying, okay, let's take our ABC, minus equals, so that means equals ABC minus the gradient, but we're just going to like decrease it a bit, we don't want to jump too far, okay, so just we're just going to go a small distance. 
So we're, going to, we're just going to somewhat arbitrarily pick 0.01. So that is now going to create a new set of parameters, which are going to be a little bit bigger than before, because we subtracted negative numbers. And we can now calculate the loss again. So remember before, it was 11.46, so hopefully it's going to get better. Yes it did. 10.11. <coughs> Um, there's one extra line of code which we didn't mention, which is with torch.nograd. Remember earlier on we said that the parameter ABC requires grad, and that means PyTorch will automatically calculate uh, its derivative when it's used in a, in a function. Here it's being used in a function, but we don't want the derivative of this. This is not our loss. right? This is us updating the gradients. So this is basically the standard in a part of a PyTorch loop, and every neural net, deep learning, pretty much every machine learning model, at least of this style, that you build, basically looks like this. If you look deep inside FastAI source code, you'll see something that basically looks like this. So we could automate that, right? So let's just take those steps, which is we're going to um, calculate Let's go back to here. We're going to calculate the um, mean squared error for our quadratic, call backward, and then subtract the gradient times a small number from the gradient. So let's do it five times. So, so far we're up to a loss of 10.1. So we're going to <coughs> calculate our loss, call dot backward to calculate the gradients, and then with no grad, Subtract the gradients times a small number, and print how we're going. And there we go. The loss keeps improving. So we now have um, some coefficients, and there they are. 3.2, 1.9, 2.0, so they're definitely heading in the right direction. So that's basically how we do, it's called optimization. Okay, so you'll hear a lot in deep learning about optimizers. This is the most basic kind of optimizer, but they're all built on this principle. Of course, it's called gradient descent. And you can see why it's called gradient descent. We calculate the gradients and then do a descent, which is in, we're trying to decrease the loss. So um, believe it or not, that's, that's the entire foundations of how we create those parameters. So we need one more piece, which is what is the mathematical function that we're finding parameters for? Um, we can't just use quadratics, right? Because it's pretty unlikely that the relationship between parameters and whether a pixel is part of a Basset hound is a quadratic. It's going to be something much more complicated. No problem. Um, it turns out that we can create an infinitely flexible function from this one tiny thing. This is called a rectified linear unit. The first piece I'm sure you will recognize, it's a linear function. We've got our output y, our input x, and coefficients m and b. This is even simpler than our quadratic. And this is a line. Then torch.clip is a function that takes that output y, and if it's greater than that number, it turns it into that number. So in other words, this is going to take anything that's negative and make it zero. So this function is going to do two things. Uh, calculate the output of a line, and if it is bigger than, uh, smaller than zero, it'll make it zero. So that's rectified linear. So let's use partial to take that function and set the m and b to one and one. So this is now going to be this function here will be y equals x plus one, followed by this torch dot clip. And here's the shape. Okay, as you would expect. It's a line until it gets under zero when it becomes, well, it's still a line. It uh, becomes a horizontal line. 
So we can now do the same thing. We can take this plot function and make it interactive using interact. And we can see what happens when we change its two parameters, m and b. So we're now plotting the rectified linear and fixing m and b. So m is the slope. Okay, and b is the, is the um, intercept, or the shift up and down. Okay, so that's how those work. Now, why is this interesting? Well, it's not interesting of itself. But what we could do is we could take this rectified linear function and create a double ReLU, which adds up two rectified linear functions together. So there's some slope m1b1, some second slope m2b2, we're going to ca calculate it at some point x. And so let's take a look at what that function looks like if we plot it. And you can see what happens is we get this downward slope, and then a hook, and then an upward slope. So if I change m1, it's going to change the slope of that first bit. And b1 is going to change its position. Okay, and I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that M2 changes the slope of the second bit, and B2 changes that location. Now, this is interesting. Why? Because we don't just have to do a double ReLU, we could add as many ReLUs together as we want. And if we add as many ReLUs together as we want, then we can have an arbitrarily squiggly function and with enough values, we can match it as close as we want. Right? So you could imagine an incredibly squiggly, like, I don't know, like an audio waveform of me speaking. And if I gave you a hundred million values to add together, you could almost exactly match that. Now we want um, functions that are not just that we can plot in 2D, we want things that can have more than one input. But you can add these together across as many dimensions as you like. And so exactly the same thing will give you a, a, a ReLU over surfaces, or a ReLU over 3D, 4D, 5D, and so forth. And it's the same idea. With this incredibly simple foundation, you can construct an arbitrarily accurate, precise um, model. Um, Problem is, you need some numbers for them, you need parameters. Oh, no problem. We know how to get parameters. We use gradient descent. So believe it or not, we have just derived deep learning. Everything from now on is um, tweaks to make it faster and make it need less data. Um, you know, th th this is this is it. Now, I remember a few years ago when I said something like this in a class. Somebody on the forum was like, "This reminds me of that thing about how to draw an owl." Jeremy's basically saying, "Okay, step one, draw two circles. Step two, draw the rest of the owl." The thing I'm, I find I have a lot of trouble explaining to students is when it comes to deep learning, there's nothing between these two steps. When you have ReLUs getting added together, and gradient descent to optimize the parameters, and samples of inputs and outputs that you want, the computer draws the owl. Right? That's, that's, that's it. Right? So we're going to learn about all these other tweaks, and they're all very important, but when you come down to like trying to understand something in deep learning, just try to keep coming back to remind yourself of what it's doing which is using gradient descent to set some parameters to make a wiggly function, which is basically the addition of lots of rectified linear units, or something very similar to that, um, match your data. Okay, so we've got some questions on the forum. Okay, so question from uh, Zakia uh, with uh, six upvotes. So for, for those of you um, Watching the video, what we do uh, in the lesson is we want to make sure that the questions that you hear answered are the ones that people really care about. Um, so we pick the ones which get the most 
upvotes. So this question is, um, is there perhaps a way to try out all the different models and automatically find the best performing one? Um, yes, absolutely you can do that. Um, so if we go back to our training script, remember there's this thing called list models, and it's a list of strings. So you can easily add a for loop around this that basically goes, you know, um, for architecture in tim.listmodels, and you could do the whole lot, which would be like that, and then you could do that, and away you go. Um, it's going to take a long time <laughs> for 500 and something models. Um, so generally speaking, like I've I've never done anything like that myself. I would rather look at a picture like this and say, like, okay, well, where am I? And the vast majority of the time, and this is something, this would be the biggest, I reckon, number one mistake of um, beginners I see, is that they jump to these models from the start of a new project. At the start of a new project, I pretty much only use ResNet 18 um, because I want to spend all of my time trying things out. I'm going to try different data augmentation, I'm going to try different ways of cleaning the data, um, I'm going to try, um, you know, um, different uh, external data I can bring in. I, and so I want to be trying lots of things and I want to be able to try it as fast as possible, right? So um, trying better architectures is the very last thing that I do. And what I do is once I've spent all this time and I've got to the point where I've got, okay, I've got my ResNet 18, or maybe, you know, ResNet 34 because it's uh, nearly as fast. Um, and I'm like, okay, well, how accurate is it? How fast is it? Do I need it more accurate for what I'm doing? Do I need it faster for what I'm doing? Could I accept some trade-off to make it a bit slower, to make it more accurate? And so then I'll have a look and I'll say, okay, well, I kind of need to be somewhere around 0.001 seconds, and so I'd try a few of these. Um, so that would be how I would think about that. Okay, next question from the forum is around, how do I know if I have enough data? What are some signs that indicate my problem needs more data? Um, I think it's pretty similar to the architecture question. So you've got some amount of data. Um, presumably you've, you know, you've started using all the data that you have access to. You've built your model, you've done your best. Is it good enough? Um, do you have the accuracy that you need for whatever it is you're doing? Um, you can't know until you've trained the model, but as you've seen, it only takes a few minutes to train a quick model. So my very strong opinion is that the vast majority of projects I see in industry wait far too long before they train their first model. You know, in my opinion, you want to train your first model on day one, with whatever CSV files or whatever that you can hack together. And you might be surprised that none of the fancy stuff you're thinking of doing is necessary because you already have a good enough accuracy for what you need. Or you might find quite the opposite. You might find that, oh my god, we're basically getting no accuracy at all, maybe it's impossible. These are things you want to know at the start, um, not at the end. Um, We'll learn lots of techniques both in this part of the course and in part two about ways to really get the most out of your data. Um, in particular, there's a reasonably recent technique called semi-supervised learning, which actually lets you get dramatically more out of your data. And we've also started talking already about data augmentation, which is a classic technique you can use. So you, generally speaking, you know, it depends how expensive is it going to be to get more data. And also, what do you mean when you say get more data? Do you mean more labeled data? Often it's easy to get lots of inputs and hard to get lots of outputs. For example, in medical imaging, where I've spent a lot of time, it's generally super easy to jump into the radiology archive and grab more CT scans, but it might be very difficult and expensive to um, you know, draw segmentation masks and, and pixel boundaries and so forth on them. So often um, you can get more um, you know, in this case images, uh, or text, or whatever, and maybe it's harder to get labels. 
And again, there's a lot of stuff you can do using stuff, things like we'll discuss semi-supervised learning to actually take advantage of unlabeled data um, as well. Okay, uh, final question here. In the quadratic example, where we calculated the initial derivatives for a, b, and c, we got values of minus 10.8, minus 2.4, etc. What unit are these expressed in? Why don't we adjust our parameters by these values themselves? So I guess the question here is why are we multiplying it by a small number, which in this case is 0.01. Okay, let's take those two parts of the question. What's the unit here? Uh, the unit is, for each increase in x of 1, how much does what, sorry, in, in, for each increase in, of, in a of 1, so if I increase a from, in this case, we're at 1.5, so if we increase from 1.5 to 2.5, what would happen to the loss? And the answer is it would go down by 10.9887. Now that's not exactly right, because it's kind of like, um, it's, it's kind of like in an infinitely small space, right? Because actually it's going to be curved, right? But it's, if, it, if it stays, it stayed at that slope. That's what would happen. Um, so if we increased b by 1, the loss would decrease if, if it stayed constant, you know, so if the slope stayed the same, the loss would decrease by minus 2.122. Uh, okay, so why would we not just change it directly by these numbers? Well, um, the reason is um, the reason is that if we uh, have some function that we're fitting, and there's some kind of interesting theory that says that once you get close enough to the the optimal value. All functions look like quadratics anyway, all right? So we can kind of safely draw it in this kind of shape because um, this is what they end up looking like if you get close enough. And we're like, let's say we're way out over here. Okay, so we are measuring. I use my daughter's favorite pens, the nice sparkly ones. So we're measuring the slope here. There's a very steep slope. Right? So that seems to suggest we should jump a really long way. So we jump a really long way, and what happened? Well, we jumped way too far. And the reason is that that slope decreased as we moved along. And so that's generally what's going to happen, right? Uh, particularly as you approach the optimal, is generally the slope is going to decrease. So that's why we multiply the gradient by a small number. And that small number is a very, very, very important number. It has a special name. It's called the learning rate. And this is an example of a hyperparameter. It's not a parameter, it's not one of the actual coefficients of your function, but it's a parameter you use to calculate the parameters. Pretty meta, right? It's a hyperparameter. And so it's something you have to pick. Now we haven't picked any yet in any of the stuff we've done, that I remember. And that's because FastAI generally picks reasonable defaults for most things. Um, but later in the course, we will learn about how to try and find really good learning rates. And you will find sometimes you need to actually spend some time finding a good learning rate. You could probably understand the intuition here. If you pick a learning rate that's too big, you'll jump too far, and so you'll end up way over here, and then you will try to then jump back again, and you'll jump too far the other way, and you'll actually diverge. And so if you ever see when your model's training that it's getting worse and worse, probably means your learning rate's too big. What would happen, on the other hand, if you pick a learning rate that's too small, then you're going to take tiny steps. And of course, the flatter it gets, the smaller the steps are going to get. And so you're going to get very, very bored. So finding the right learning rate is a compromise between the speed at which you find the answer 
and the possibility that you're actually going to shoot past it and get worse and worse. Okay, so um, one of the bits of feedback I got quite a lot in the survey is that people want um, a break halfway through, which I think is a good idea. So I think now's a good time to have a break. So let's um, come back in 10 minutes at 25 past 7. Okay, hope you had a good rest, uh, have a good break, I should say. Um, so I want to now show you a really, really important mathematical computational trick, um, which is we want to do a whole bunch of values. All right, so we're going to be wanting to do a whole lot of mx plus b's. And we want, don't just want to do mx plus b, we're going to want to have like lots of variables. So for example, every single pixel of an image would be a separate variable. So we're going to multiply every single one of those times some coefficient, and then add them all together, and then do the, um, the crop, the, the ReLU. And then we're going to do it a second time with a second bunch of parameters, and then a third time, and a fourth time, and a fifth time. Um, it's going to be pretty inconvenient to write out 100 million ReLUs. Um, but so happens, there's a mathematical, a single mathematical operation that does all of those things for us, except for the final replace negatives with zeros, and it's called matrix multiplication. I expect everybody at some point did matrix multiplication at high school. I suspect also a lot of you have forgotten how it works. Um, when people talk about linear algebra in deep learning, uh, they give the impression you need years of graduate school study to learn all this linear algebra, you don't. Actually, you, all you need almost all the time is matrix multiplication, and it couldn't be simpler. I'm going to show you a couple of different ways. The first is there's a really cool site called matrixmultiplication.xyz. You can put in any matrix you want. So I'm going to put in oops, this one. So this matrix is saying I've got three rows of data with three uh, variables, so maybe they're, they're tiny, tiny, tiny images with three pixels, and the value of the first one is 1, 2, 1, the second is 0, 1, 1, and the third is 2, 3, 1. So those are our three rows of data. These are our three sets of coefficients. So we've got A, B, and C in our data, so, so I guess you'd call it x1, x2, and x3. And then here's our first set of coefficients, A, B, and C, 2, 6, and 1. And then our second set is 5, 7, and 8. So here's what happens when we do matrix multiplication. That second, this matrix here of coefficients, gets flipped around, and we do, this is the multiplications and additions that I mentioned, right? So multiply, add, multiply, add, multiply, add. So that's going to give you the first number, because that is the left-hand column of the second matrix times the first row, so that gives you the top left result. So the next one is going to give us two results, right? So we've got now the right-hand one with the top row, and the left-hand one with the second row. Keep going down, keep going down, and that's it. That's what matrix multiplication is. It's multiplying things together and adding them up. So there'd be one more step to do to make this a layer of a neural network, which is if this had any negatives, we would replace them with zeros. That's why matrix multiplication is the critical foundational mathematical operation in basically all of deep learning. So the um, GPUs that we use, the thing that they are good at is this, matrix multiplication. They have special cores called tensor cores which uh, can basically only do one thing, which is to multiply together two 4x4 four four matrices. Um, and then they do that lots of times with bigger matrices. So I'm going to show you an example of this. We're actually going to build a complete machine learning model on real data in a spreadsheet. So 
Fast AI has become kind of famous for a number of things, and one of them is using spreadsheets to create deep learning models. Um, we haven't done it for a couple of years, so I'm pretty pumped to show this to you. Um, what I've done is I went over to Kaggle, where there's a competition I actually helped create many years ago called Titanic. And it's like a, an ongoing competition. So 14,000 people have entered it, so well, teams have entered it so far. Um, it's just a competition for a bit of fun. There's no end date. And the data for it is the data about um, who, uh, here it is, training data, uh, who survived and who didn't uh, from the, the real Titanic disaster. And so I, I clicked here on the download button to grab it on my computer. That gave me a CSV, which I opened up in Excel. Um, the first thing I did then was I just removed a few columns that clearly were not going to be important, things like the name of the passengers, the passenger ID, um, just to try to make it a bit simpler. And so I've ended up with each row of this is one passenger. The first column is the dependent variable. The dependent variable is the thing we're trying to predict. Did they survive? And the remaining are some information such as what class of the boat, first, second or third class, their sex, their age, how many siblings in the family, uh, P. Arch, I think is parents or something. So you should always look for a data dictionary, right, to find out what's what. Number of parents and children, okay. Um, what was their fare, and which of the three cities did they embark on? Cherbourg, Queenstown, South Africa. Okay, so there's our data. Um, now when I first grabbed it, I noticed that there were some people with no age. Now, um, there's all kinds of things we could do for that, but for this purpose, I just decided to remove them. And I found the same thing for Embarked. I removed the blanks as well. Um, but that left me with nearly all of the data. Okay, so then I've put that over here. Uh, here's our data with those rows removed. Um, and Okay, that's the, so this, these are the columns that came directly from Kaggle. So basically what we now want to do is we want to multiply each of these by a coefficient. How do you multiply the word male by a coefficient? And how do you multiply s by a coefficient? Um, you can't. So I converted all of these to numbers. Male and female are very easy. I created a column called is male. And as you can see, there's just an if, if statement that says if sex is male, then it's one, otherwise it's zero. And we can do something very similar for embarked. We can have one column called did they embark in Southampton? Same deal. And another column for did they, what's it called, Cherbourg? Cherbourg. Did they embark in Cherbourg? Um, and now P class is one, two, or three, which is a number, but it's not really it's not really a continuous measurement of something. There isn't one or two or three things. They're different levels, so I decided to turn those into similar things, into these binary. They're called, these are called binary categorical variables. So are they first class and are they second class? Um, okay, so that's all that. Um, the other thing that I was thinking, well, you know, then I kind of tried it and checked out what happened, and what happened was the people with, um, so I, I, I created some random numbers. So to create the random numbers, I just went uh, equals rand, right? And I copied those to the right. And then I just went copy and I went paste values. So that gave me some random numbers. And that's my like, so I just, because like I was like, before I said, oh, A, B, and C, let's just start them at 1.5, 1.5, 1.5. What we do in real life is we start our parameters at random numbers that are a bit more or a bit less than zero. So these are random numbers. Actually, uh, sorry, I slightly lied. I didn't use rand, I used rand minus 0 0.5, and that way I got small numbers that were on either side of zero. Um, so then when I took each of these and I multiplied them by 
um, our fares and ages and so forth. What happened was that these numbers here are way bigger than you know these numbers here, and so in the end, all that mattered was what was their fare, because uh, they were just bigger than everything else. So I wanted everything to basically go from zero to one. These numbers were too big. So what I did up here is I just grabbed the maximum of this column, the maximum of all the fares is 512. And so then, um, actually I'll do age first. I did a maximum of age, because similar thing, right? There's 80 year olds and there's two year olds. And so then I, over here I just did, okay, well what's their age divided by the maximum? And so that way all of these are between zero and one just like all of these are between 0 and 1. So that's how I fix, this is called normalizing the data. Um, now, we haven't done any of these things when we've done stuff with FastAI, and that's because FastAI does all of these things for you, um, and we'll learn about how, right? Um, but it's, all these things are being done behind the scenes. Um, for FAIR, I did something a bit more, which is I noticed there's some lots of very small fares, and there's also some a few very big fares. So like seventy dollars, and then seven dollars, seven dollars. Generally speaking, when you have lots of really big numbers and a few small ones, so generally speaking, when you've got a few really big numbers and lots of really small numbers, this is really common with um, with with money. You know, because money kind of follows this relationship where a few people have lots of it and they spend huge amounts of it, and most people don't have heaps. Um, if you take the log of something that's like that has that kind of extreme distribution, you end up with something that's much more evenly distributed. So I've added this here called log fair, as you can see, and these are all around one, which isn't bad. I could have normalized that as well, but I was too lazy. I didn't bother because it seemed okay. So at this point, you can now see that if we start from here, all of these are all around the same kind of level, right? So none of these columns are going to saturate the others. Um, so now I've got my coefficients, which are just, as I said, they're just random. Okay? And so now I need to basically calculate AX1 plus BX2 plus CX3 plus blah, 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 blah. Okay. And so to do that, um, you can use some product in Excel. I could have typed it out by hand, which would be very boring, but some product is just going to multiply each of these. This one will be multiplied by, where is it? Subset by this one. This one will be multiplied by this one, so forth, and then they get all added together. Now one thing, if you're eagle-eyed, you might be wondering, is in a linear equation we have y equals mx plus b. At the end there's this constant term, and I do not have any constant term. I've got something here called const, but I don't have any plus at the end. Um, how do we, how's that working? Well there's a nice trick that we pretty much always use in machine learning, which is to add a column of data just containing the number one every time. If you have a column of data containing the number one every time, then that parameter becomes your constant term. So you don't have to have a special constant term, um, and so it makes our um, code a little bit simpler when you do it that way. It's just a trick, but everybody does it. Okay, so this is now the result of our linear model. So this is not, I'm not even going to do ReLU, right? I'm just going to do um, a plain regression. Right? Um, now if you've done regression before, you might have learned about it as something you kind of solve with various matrix things, um, but in fact um, you can solve a regression using gradient descent. So I've just gone ahead and created a loss for each row, and so the loss is going to be equal to um, our prediction minus whether they survived squared. So this is going to be our squared error. And there they all are, our squared errors. And so here I've just summed them up. I could have taken the mean. I guess that would have been a bit easier to think about, but sum is going to give us the same result. So here's our loss. Um, and so now we need to optimize that using gradient descent. 
So Microsoft Excel has a gradient descent optimizer in it called Solver. So I'll click Solver and it'll say, okay, what are you trying to op optimize? It's this one here and I'm going to do it by changing uh, these cells here and I'm trying to minimize it. And so we're starting at a loss of 55.78. Actually, let's change it to mean as well. Is it mean or average? Probably average. All right, so start at 1.03. So optimize that. And there we go. So it's gone from 1.03 to 0.1. And so we can check the predictions. So the first one, it predicted exactly correctly. It was, they didn't survive and we predict it wouldn't survive. Ditto for this one, it was very close. And you can start to see, um, so this one, you can start to see a few issues here, which is like sometimes it's predicting less than one, sorry, less than zero, and sometimes it's predicting more than one. Wouldn't it be cool if we had some way of wouldn't it be cool if we had some way of constraining it to between 0 and 1? And that's an example of some of the things we're going to learn about that make this stuff work a little bit better. Right? But you can see it's doing an okay job. So this is not deep learning, this is not a neural net yet, this is just a regression. So to make it into a neural net, we need to do it multiple times. So I'm just going to do it twice. So now rather than one set of coefficients, I've got two sets. And again, I just put in random numbers. Um, other than that, all the data is the same. And so now I'm going to have my sum product again. So the first sum product is with my first set of coefficients. And my second sum product is with my second set of coefficients. So I'm just calling them linear 1 and linear 2. Now there's no point adding those up together, because if you add up two linear functions together, you get another linear function. We want to get all those wiggles, right? So that's why we have to do our ReLU. So in Microsoft Excel, ReLU looks like this. If the number is less than zero, use zero, otherwise use the number. So that's how we're going to replace the negatives with zeros. Um, and then finally, if you remember from our spreadsheet, we have to add them together. So we add the ReLUs together. So that's going to be our prediction. And then our loss is the same as the other sheet, it's just survived minus prediction squared. And let's change that to mean, not mean, average. Okay, so let's try solving that. Optimize, AH1, and this time we're changing all of those. Solve. So this is using gradient descent. Excel solve is not the fastest in the world, but it gets the job done. Okay, let's see how we went. 0.08 for our deep learning model versus 0.1 for our regression. So it's a bit better. So there you go. So we've now created our first deep learning neural network from scratch. And we did it in Microsoft Excel, everybody's favorite artificial intelligence uh, tool. Um, so that was a bit um, slow and painful. Um, be a bit faster and easier if we used matrix multiplication. So let's finally do that. So this next one is going to be exactly the same as the last one, but with matrix multiplication. So all our data looks the same. You'll notice the key difference now is our parameters have been transposed. So before I had the parameters matching the data in terms of being in columns. For matrix multiplication, the, um, the expectation is, the way matrix multiplication work, works, is that you have to transpose this, so it goes, the x and y is kind of uh, the opposite way around, the rows and columns are the opposite way around. Um, other than that, it's the same, I've got the same, I just copied and pasted the random numbers, so we had exactly the same starting point. And so now, our entire, this entire thing here is a single function, which is, which is Matrix multiply all of this by all of this. And so when I run that, 
it fills in exactly the same numbers. Make this average. And so now we can optimize that. Okay, make that a minimum by changing these. Solve. I should get the same number. Point oh wait, wasn't it? Yep, and we do. Okay, so that's just another way of doing the same thing. So you can see that um, matrix multiplication, it takes like um, a surprisingly long time, at least for me, to get an intuitive feel for matrix multiplication as like a single mathematical operation. So I still find it helpful to kind of remind myself it's just doing these sum products um, and additions. Um, okay, so that is um, that is a deep learning neural network in Microsoft Excel, um, and the Titanic Kaggle competition, by the way, um, is a pretty fun learning competition. If you haven't done much machine learning before. Um, then it's certainly worth like, trying out just to get, kind of get the feel for these, how these all get put together. So this is um, um, so the the chapter of the book that this lesson goes with is uh, chapter four, and chapter four of the book is the chapter where we lose the most people because it's um, to be honest, it's hard. Um, but part of the reason it's hard is I couldn't put this into a book, right? So um, we're teaching it a very different way in the course to what's in the book, um, and you know you can use the two together. But if you've tried to read the book and been a bit disheartened, um, yeah, try you know try following through through the spreadsheet instead. Um, maybe try creating like if you use Numbers or Google Sheets or something, you could try to create your own kind of version of it on whatever spreadsheet platform. You prefer, or you could try to do it yourself from scratch in Python. You know, if you want to really test yourself. Um, so there's some suggestions. Okay. Um, okay. Question from uh, Victor Guerra. Um, in the Excel exercise. When Jeremy is doing some feature engineering, he comes up with two new columns, pclass1 and pclass2. That is true. pclass1 and pclass2. Why is there no pclass3 column? Um, is it because pclass1, if pclass1 is 0 and pclass2 is 0, then pclass3 must be 1? So in a way, two columns are enough to encode the input of the original column? Yes, that's exactly the reason. So. There's um, no need to tell the computer about things it can kind of figure out for itself. Um, so when you create, these are called dummy variables. So when you create dummy variables for a categorical variable with three levels, like this one, you need two dummy variables. So in general, a categorical variable with n levels needs n minus one uh, columns. Thanks for the good question. So what we're going to be doing in our next lesson is looking at uh, natural language processing. Um, so so far we've looked at some computer vision, and just now we've looked at some what we call tabular data, so, so kind of spreadsheet type data. Um, next up we're going to be looking at natural language processing. So I'll give you a taste of it, so you might want to open up the Getting, Start with, Getting Started with NLP for Absolute Beginners um, notebook. So here's the Getting Started with NLP for Absolute Beginners notebook. I will say as a uh, notebook author, I um, may sound a bit lame, but I always see when people have upvoted it, it always makes me really happy, So um, and it also helps other people find it. So remember to upvote these notebooks or any other notebooks you, you like. I also always read all the comments, so if you want to uh, ask any questions or make any comments, I, I enjoy those as well. Um, So um, natural language processing 
is about uh, rather than taking, for example, image data and making predictions, we take text data. Uh, that text data most of the time is in the form of prose, so like plain English text. Uh, so you know English is the most common language used for NLP, but there's uh, NLP models in dozens of different languages nowadays. Um, and if you're uh, a non-English speaker, um, you'll find uh, that for many languages there's less resources in non-English languages, and there's a great opportunity um, to provide uh, NLP resources in your language. This has actually been one of the things that the Fast AI community has been fantastic at in the global community, is building NLP um, uh, resources, for example, the first uh, Farsi um, uh, NLP resource was created uh, by a student from the very first Fast.ai course. Um, the Indic languages, um, some of the best resources have come out of Fast.ai alumni and so forth. So that's a particularly valuable thing you could look at. Um, so if your language is not well represented, that's an opportunity, um, not a problem. Um, so some examples of things you could use NLP for, well, perhaps the most common and practically useful in my opinion is classification. Classification means you take a document, now when I say a document, that could just be one or two words, it could be a book, it could be a Wikipedia page, so it could be any length. We use the word document, it sounds like that's a specific kind of length, but it can be a very short thing or a very long thing. We take a document and we try to figure out a category for it. Now that can cover many, many different kinds of applications. So one common one that we'll look at a bit is sentiment analysis. Um, so for example, is this movie review positive or negative? Sentiment analysis is very helpful in things like marketing and product development. You know, in big companies there's lots and lots of um, you know information coming in about your product. It's very nice to be able to quickly sort it out and to kind of track metrics from week to week. Something like figuring out what author wrote the document um, would be an example of a classification exercise, because you're trying to put it a, a category, in this case is which author. I think there's a lot of opportunity in legal discovery, there's already some products in this area, where in this case the category is, um, is this uh, legal document in scope or out of scope uh, in the court case. Um, just organizing documents, uh, triaging inbound emails, so like which part of the organization should it be sent to, is it an urgent or not, um, stuff like that. So these are examples of categories of classification. Um, what you'll find is when we look at um, classification tasks in NLP, is it's going to look very, very similar to um, images. But what we're going to do is we're going to use a different library. Uh, the library we're going to use is called Hugging Face Transformers rather than Fast AI. And there's two reasons for that. Um, the main reason why is because I think it's really helpful to see how things are done in more than one library. And Hugging Face Transformers, yeah, so um, FastAI has a, a, a very layered architecture, so you can do things at a very higher level with very little code, or you can dig deeper and deeper and deeper, getting more and more fine grained. Um, Hugging Face Transformers doesn't have the same high level API at all that um, FastAI has, so you have to do more stuff manually. And so at this point of the course, you know, we're going to actually intentionally use a library which is a little bit less user-friendly um, in order to see kind of what extra steps you have to go through to use other uh, libraries. Having said that, the reason I picked this particular library is it is particularly good. Um, it has uh, really good models in it, uh, it has a lot of really good techniques in it, um, not at all surprising because they have hired lots and lots of fast AI alumni, so they have very high quality people working on it. Um, so um, before the next lesson, um, yeah, um, if you've got time, um, take, it, uh, take a look at this notebook and take a look at the data. The data we're going to be working with <coughs> is quite interesting. It's from a Kaggle competition which is trying to figure out uh, um, in patterns whether two concepts are referring to the same thing or not, where those concepts are represented as English text. And when you think about it, that is a classification task, because the document is, you know, basically text one, blah, text two, blah, and then the category is similar or not similar. Um, and in fact, in this case, 
they actually have scores. It's either got to be basically 0, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or 1 of like how similar is it. But it's basically a classification task when you think of it that way. Um, so yeah, you can um, have a look at the data and um, next week we're going to go through uh, step by step through this notebook. And we're going to take advantage of that as an opportunity also to talk about the really important um, uh, topics of validation sets and metrics, which are two of the most important topics in um, not just deep learning, but machine learning more generally. All right, thanks everybody. I'll see you next week. Bye.